Merry Christmas. I want to take one last chance to be able to say that to you for next time we meet we will have come to the end of the Christmas season but right now we are still in Christmas. Jesus is the only person I know of who gets a 12-day Christmas celebration. We are in the this will last until the 6th of Epiphany, the 6th of January, which is Epiphany. And one of the more important questions that you can be asked at this time of year, especially this year, this year of 2015-2016 Christmas, is who's seen the new Star Wars? Who's seen the Wonderful. I'm so glad. Yeah, that's a good thing, right? It was an impressive movie, and uh, in many ways it felt like an homage to the first movie, the, you know, the original Star Wars 1977, the A New Hope. Who saw that in the theaters? Oh, good, good. That's very important to have seen that movie, right? It's, uh, those two movies are, are very similar in many ways, and uh, it's not a bad thing, right? So they both play the, the same role at the beginning of a story. The first part in the trilogy, it, it's always full, full of warm and fuzzies, right? The first part in the trilogy always has... Um, I don't, I don't think I'm telling you any, anything spoilerific it, to tell you that in the first Star Wars in 1977 that the good guys win, right? No, no surprises there. That at the end of the movie that you get that shot of uh, Luke and Han and, and Leia and Chewie and they're all uh, the big John Williams score and playing. They've, they've won and, and then it goes to black. And you know, you know who, the only person who didn't, get, who didn't get a medal was Chewbacca. And he got a Lifetime Achievement Award a few years ago where they gave him the medal that he didn't get in the movie because it was some sort of, why didn't you give Chewbacca the medal? He was there. But um, it, the movie ends and the first part of the story is done and we've met these characters and we love them and it's wonderful. Right? And, and in a similar way, we've, we're finishing up this first part of the story of Jesus and, and we've, we've had all, all of our warms and fuzzy moments here. Right? We've had angels and mangers and silent night and holy night and, and we've had all these good moments but we don't get to stay with Jesus at the manger, do we? We pick up reading what happens next and Jesus is on the move. He is running with, uh, well, his family is running off to Egypt taking him with him for Herod who has been appointed the king of the Jews by Rome is afraid of any threat to his power and what he is doing because he is afraid is he kills every child under the age of two in the area in which Jesus has been born. This is the moment in which you might say the empire strikes back. Right? Isn't it a fitting comparison there? Yes, I've watched the first three Star Wars movie more times than I care to admit. But we end the first movie with this, everything is great, everything is wonderful, but that's not the end of the story, right? The Empire responds, something happens, and so there is the next movie begins, and the Empire is building it's another Death Star, they're invading Hoth, the struggle continues. And that's true here as, as well. Just because Jesus has been born does not mean that everything is made right and perfect in the world. The empire still has power. Herod can still uh, kill hundreds of children, and, and that's what happens. It is not that because Jesus is born that Herod is, is a bad fellow and, and he is going to uh, do this atrocity. It's that it, it's one more reason, one more thing that Herod does in a lifetime of atrocities. It's like with. Uh, this is kind of getting in the weeds. Did Leia cause Alderaan to get blown up by the Death Star? No. They were going to blow up a planet. Leia was there, so they happened to blow up her planet. She didn't cause them to build the Death Star. She just ended up being the good excuse to blow up hers, right? Jesus did not cause Herod to commit atrocities. He ended up being the reason why Herod committed that particular atrocity. But Herod had committed a lifetime of atrocities up till then, and this was just one more. It is kind of a sad thing that in this moment of joy, the birth of Jesus, that someone is able to take it and use it, see it as a threat and to turn it into such an evil that children are slaughtered. That there is such evil still in the world is not a sign that Jesus' birth doesn't matter. It is instead a sign that it is so very needed for more people to accept that birth as important. And in the face of this impending slaughter, Jesus and family flee, and the, and the middle of the story begins. And, and what happens in the middle of the story? Right? Well, in the middle of a story, in the second book in a trilogy, in the second movie of a trilogy, we learn more about the characters, right? I, I talked to a, an English teacher friend of mine yesterday, and I found out the term for this. It's called the rising action. This is the point at which it's sort of a, who the characters are is 
unpacked and we start to learn who, who they really are, what would f find out more about their background. And that's actually what is happening here. Not only do we learn about Herod and the fact that uh, there are still evil in the world even after Jesus has been born, we also see how Matthew lays out very clearly who Jesus is. Who, who do you need to think about to understand Jesus? And what Matthew wants us to see is Moses. Right? He wants us to look back to Moses. Moses himself had said back in Deuteronomy, 15, or Deuteronomy 18, the book of Deuteronomy is five speeches by Moses. It's sort of like his parting addresses to the people. And so one of his last speeches, he tells the people, there will be another prophet like me. And then we know if you look at the book of Acts, both Stephen and Peter, when Stephen talks to the crowd and Peter talks to Sanhedrin, both of them talk about Jesus as a prophet like Moses. And then Matthew is doing the same thing here. He's holding up the ways that uh, Jesus' life unfolds. And if you know anything about the life of Moses, the comparison becomes very clear. Both, of, both Pharaoh and King Herod massacre male children, male Hebrew children, because they are afraid of the power of the, of the Jewish people and what might happen. Both Mo Moses and Jesus are saved by drastic and risky action of their faithful parents, who see their their children as a gift from God. Both Moses and Jesus have to flee to save their lives and are called back when the person who sought to have them killed is, is dead. For Moses, it was the Pharaoh. For Jesus, it was King Herod. Both Moses and Jesus are called by God to lead people. Moses leads people out of slavery. Jesus leads people out of sin. It's, just not, it's not just these obvious connections that can be made either. It's just the very style that Matthew writes this, this, this part of the gospel. It feels very Old Testament-y. Very Old Testament-ish, if, if you like. Right? I cannot overemphasize how important a connection is being made here. Right? What Moses did, what the Exodus is the central event of the Old Testament. It is remembered in the Passover with the, where the Seder meal is eaten, and Moses then gives the law to the people such that they know how to live. And the life, death, and resurrection, that's the central moment in the New Testament. right? And the Easter, what is Easter? It happens at the same time. It is a reinterpretation of the Passover event. right? And in communion, we gather around communion. And when did communion begin? It began as a Seder meal. And Jesus gives the new law. Right? The whole Gospel of Matthew trying to help us see uh, Jesus as a prophet like Moses. Moses gives the Ten Commandments. What does Jesus give? The Sermon on the Mount. It's again giving the law so that the people know how to live. Matthew is doing everything he can do to make sure that when, that when we look at Jesus, we think of Moses. We think of what God has done in the past so we can interpret what Jesus is about to do. Right? We can only know, if you want to know who Jesus is, you got to know who Moses was. Without this connection between the Old Testament and, two, and the New Testament, we just lose track of who's who. Right? Without, now, there have been times when we have attempted to ditch the Old Testament, and the first time, you know, you can go into a bookstore and, and buy a, a Bible that only has the New Testament, right? Is that really a Bible? Well, you know, this has been tried before. It's been tried for centuries. We've been trying to sell the Bible as just the New Testament. It goes all the way back to a dude named Marcion back in about 150 A.D. And he, as the, the church began, it was mostly Jews who were inviting non-Jewish people to join the church. And then as you get into the second century... It becomes mostly non-Jewish people with a few Jews who, who are, are also followers of Jesus. And, and this guy named Marcion makes this argument that we don't need the Old Testament anymore. That's a Jewish thing. We don't need it. Why do we need to have that? And, and the bishops of the church got together and they argued about this and they came to the agreement that they didn't know who Jesus was if they didn't have who Moses was. And you can buy a Bible without the Old Testament, but it really isn't the Bible. Right? In the same way, what, what happens, if that was one of the first big arguments of the church, do we really need the Old Testament? Well, in the next argument of the church was, 
Well, what is the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament the same person? Right? We, there's this, do you ever hear people wonder what happened between the Old and the New Testament? There's sort of this idea that the Old Testament God was all judgmental and angry and, and furious and wrathful and all, all go kill people in the name of God. And then we get to Jesus in the New Testament, it's like, wow, who showed up there? Jesus, warm, fuzzy, everyone sit down, have a meal together. What, what happened? How did we get from that angry God to, to this this graceful person we see in Jesus. And, and again, the church, the name for this was a Gnosticism. It's, and this also happens in the late second century. And um, again, the church had to get together and, and discuss this and say, you know, we don't know who Jesus is unless we know Moses. Right? And, and do you think that the problems we have in reading the Old Testament, do you think that's the problem because God changed from the Old Testament to the New? Or do you think that's more of a problem in our understanding? Right? Think about how our understanding changes over time. You look at something and you understand it clearer over time, later in life than you did earlier in life. I don't think the Old Testament shows us an angry God. I think our understanding of God was not that great in the Old Testament, and it gets a lot better when Jesus shows up to show us more fully who God is. And so if you want, and again, if you want to know who Jesus is, you got to look at Moses, but then Jesus takes Moses and goes a lot, a lot farther, doesn't he? He shows us a lot more about who God is. Moses helps us start to understand Jesus, but, but he is, goes fo- so much further. Right? We see that we have to have the Old Testament to understand the new to be able to understand where Jesus starts out. It's fitting that at the beginning of the story of Jesus we have these comparisons to Moses. It sets the stage so we can follow where he goes. We can see that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God who became flesh in the child Jesus, who then comes to be amongst us in the Holy Spirit. That's how we read the Gospel of Matthew rightly, as Matthew intended us to see. We see that Moses, just as Moses led the people of God out of slavery, so that same, in the same way Jesus leads the people out of bondage to sin. Moses leads one exodus, Jesus leads another. And, and it's amazing how this passage both shows us how to understand Jesus. First you've got to look at Moses, then you can understand Jesus. And it also reminds us how much Jesus is needed. Jesus is born, but Herod still slaughters children. Right? The empire will still strike back. There is still evil in the world. That doesn't mean that Jesus' birth didn't matter. It means his birth is ever more needed. A child has been born and we follow him, not because he causes such evil, not because he condones such evil. We follow him because his way, the way of the Prince of Peace, leads us the only way we will ever escape from and overcome such evil. Thanks be to God. Amen.